Hi. Um, welcome. Uh, I am not Charlie Royer. Um, my name is Ross Guerin, and I'm the chair of the Institute's Student Advisory Committee. Welcome to you tonight. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about our Thursday night events this semester. Last week was Michael Dukakis, and we're having a whole series leading up to the election, and we hope you'll join us every Thursday night. Next Thursday night will be an event on women in politics, and the following Thursday night we'll have something on the media and the 92 race. So we hope you'll just keep coming back and uh, staying around at the Institute of Politics up until the election when we'll have a big election night bash. So let me just turn this evening over to Charlie Royer, former mayor of Seattle and director of the Institute of Politics. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. You handled that beautifully. Um, welcome to the forum for the um, maiden voyage of our new fellows, uh, their opportunity to introduce themselves to you and to give you some idea of what their study groups uh, this semester will be all about, to hopefully interest you in attending uh, one or all of, of uh, those uh, interesting classes uh, during the semester. Um, each fellow has a few minutes to uh, talk about his or her political career from a personal perspective, and then we'll open it up to questions and uh, answers uh, from the audience. Uh, first, Tom Matthews is a founder and senior consultant to Craver Matthews Smith & Company, national consulting and direct mail firm uh, for some of the country's largest public interest organizations. Tom is a founder of Common Cause. He's one of the architects of the Peace Corps. He worked both for President Kennedy and for his brother Robert having basically created the independent John Anderson's campaign, and given what happened today, uh, Tom is especially timely with his study group called Third Party Politics, The Next American Revolution. Tom Matthews. Thank you, Charles. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and it's a uh, rather a first thing for me because I'm quite used to hiding behind the potted palms in public affairs because I discovered there's little limit to what you can do if somebody else gets the credit. Uh, I am the subversive on this board, uh, but I began as a, uh, a Democrat as a child. My father was a working man uh, who didn't get past the fifth grade. Uh, we went through the Depression and some hard times together. I worked my way through school. Uh, I'm a product of a, of a remote university in Utah. Uh, I, I come from a maverick Western background. And uh, I, I learned from my father that the Democratic Party was the party of the working man. And that stayed with me through my professional life. I began as a newspaper reporter, uh, and I was a reporter for about 14 years, the last 10 of which were on the San Francisco Chronicle. Then I lost my masthead and went on the other side of the door uh, with the Kennedy administration, and uh, that led to uh, some more political activity that wound up finally with my allying myself with John Gardner and the formation of Common Cause. And that's when I went underground, really. The, uh, I became involved in organizing a number of massive constituencies for single issues. Uh, my partner and I have a firm, and we were principal fundraisers for organizations like the ACLU and Planned Parenthood and NOW and Handgun Control and Greenpeace and Sierra Club and uh, there are about 15 of them that we uh, raise money for. But we also had a political agenda. In 1970, the middle 70s, we raised a lot of money and f helped finance Mo Udall's campaign to the end because of our understanding of that segment of our society that gives money to uh, progressive 
and different independent kind of causes. Mo was able to continue to the end of the convention when Jackson and a lot of other heavily funded candidates had to drop out. And of course, as we know, Carter won. In 1980, my eye was caught by John Anderson, who appeared in, uh, in Iowa and told all the Iowa grain farmers that the uh, grain legislation that was before Congress was idiotic. And all the other candidates uh, played to the farmer. A week later, he showed up in New Hampshire and he told the National Rifle Association they were nuts. <laughs> and I, th I said to myself, the guy has really got what my people will love. So here in Cambridge, in a bedroom over Bob Farmer's garage, <laughs> I saw John Anderson and I said to him, you haven't got a chance in hell of getting the Republican nomination. And I don't think you really want to be president anyway. I think you're involved in a dernier cri. This is your swan song from public life. You want to go out and say all the things that you have not been able to say until now because it would have been suicidal. And if you'll do that, my partner and I will raise enough money for you to run a creditable campaign to the very end. And uh, Kiki uh, jumped up and down on the bed and made a prophetic announcement saying, we'll start a third party, we'll start a third party, we'll start a third party, and we did. Uh, we recruited uh, Dave Garth to run the television and Mitch Govan at Arnold and Porter to uh, run the ballot access effort, and we raised about $10 million for Anderson to go through that race. He got up to 28%, about like Perot, then faded to 7 one of the reasons he faded as far as he did was because he began to think he could be elected. <laughs> <laughs> that was the death of it. Uh, Garth turned into Svengali and uh, prescribed every conventional political trick in the book, and the gas went up out of her balloon. And uh, we, we uh, as Mary McGorry said, here's to Tom Matthews, the only guy in political history who's taken a candidate from 28 to 7 percent. <laughs> I tell that story because it's relevant to what's happening to the country now. It's kind of a forerunner of the phenomenon that you see around Perot. Perot's an empty vessel. Perot, and I, I, I think, don't think we'll get beyond single digits, uh, but the energy and the hope and the intensity that poured into his campaign is evidence of a subterranean current that's running through this country that nobody knows how deep or how powerful it is. And uh, my conviction that uh, if there isn't a radical change in the way that government functions in this country, that this current is going to flow into some kind of another political party. Thank you. <coughs> Pat McGovern uh, represents her city of Lawrence, Massachusetts in the State Senate and since 1985 has served as chair of the Ways and Means Committee of the Senate. She is leaving politics at the end, she is leaving that office at the end of the year, but we assume she is not leaving uh, politics. Uh, her study group uh, will be women in politics. How far have we come? Pat McGovern. Thank you, Charlie, very much. I'm delighted, as Tom said, and honored to be with uh, all of you this evening and to be with such a distinguished group of fellows. One of the nicest things for me is getting to know people like Tom Matthews, and I won't go through them all, but Bill and Barbara and Kenneth and uh, Jim. Um, it's been fun, and uh, it's been, it, it's been uh, truly a privilege just to listen to Tom's wonderful stories. And some of you young people probably didn't know who Kiki was, John Anderson's wife, and I remember it all sort of comes back to me when he tells the stories, and I realize uh, how much I have to learn from my colleagues. Um, we were asked to sort of tell a little bit about ourselves, but perhaps to tell you some anecdotes, why we got, or why someone such as myself got into politics, why did I run? And when I started to think that through, I guess perhaps for me there were three reasons. 
Uh, one is sort of the conventional reason. My family was involved with uh, politics and government uh, for a number of years. Uh, we are, as Tom said, uh, I'm, I'm also from a working class family, and the Democratic Party and what uh, President Roosevelt did in terms of the Roosevelt Coalition made all the difference uh, in the world to my family. So I was wa raised to think that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was one of the great saviors, uh, uh, an opinion, by the way, I still hold. I, I haven't changed my mind on that. And uh, my family got involved. One of my uncles headed the Massachusetts uh, Federation of Labor. Uh, that's the organization that existed in each state before the AFL and the CIO merged nationally, and then all the state offices merged. He ran for elective office, and he won. Uh, finding it too difficult, he decided not to seek re-election. He, he found that the time was never his own and preferred to work behind the scenes. Uh, he served as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Commissioner of Labor and Industries and had a long and a varied and distinguished career. And I always found it fun to be around him. I found it fun to listen to him. I found it inspiring to, to, to learn from him and to understand that you can make a difference when you either run for office or serve in office or help people uh, get elected to office. And so it's always been a, a family interest of mine and politics was always talked about in my family and government. I was talking uh, uh, with one of the uh, members of the Student uh, Advisory Committee this evening, and we were talking about the uh, Joseph McCarthy hearings. In Massachusetts, it was a very heavily pro-Joseph McCarthy state, and I remember the arguments and the fights in my family about Senator McCarthy, and were you for him or were you against him, and if so, why? Uh, so as, 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 even as a little girl, I, I very politically um, involved uh, family, and it was very important to me. And I think for a woman of my age, that was perhaps extremely unusual. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are two other, two other sort of reasons I got involved, and this is going to sound perhaps um, uh, schlocky, and I, forgive me for that, it's absolutely true, and that's President Kennedy. For men and women of my generation, Jack Kennedy reached out to us in a way that I don't think I can explain to you young people. I don't think that you've ever really experienced it. I hope you do. He was superb in energizing men and women, uh, Republicans as well as Democrats, to believe in America, to believe you should run for office, you should help people seek office, you should get involved, and indeed you can make a difference. And he challenged a whole generation uh, of young people in this country, and a lot of us got involved because we believed what he had uh, to say, and he made a profound difference. Uh, he was a natural leader. We hear about his char charisma, but to experience it, to feel it, to be involved with it, uh, was truly a wonderful experience. And a lot of us, I think, were energized by and turned on by Jack Kennedy, especially those of us uh, from Massachusetts. And lastly, a reason I got involved is that I come from a, a mill city to, to the north uh, of us here, a city of Lawrence, which I now represent in the Massachusetts Senate. And growing up, uh, I was frustrated, appalled, and angered by uh, the way the government of that city was run. Uh, the level of corruption, uh, the lack of services, uh, people who would seek election that I thought were unfit to hold public office. Um, it angered me, and I truly believe that we can do better in government. We could then, and we can now, that there are decent, honorable, compassionate, competent people who are out there, who if we can get them involved and get them to run for office, really can make a difference. Um, and, and that was a very personal thing for me, to read the newspapers and to listen to these people and to watch them and to be made angry by them and frustrated by them because I knew there was a better way, there had to be a better way. Uh, we had to have a government that was more responsive that had more decency and certainly one that had more integrity. So it was a combination of the city in which I was raised, the family in which I was raised, and the energy and the enthusiasm conveyed to me by President Kennedy. And I suspect there were other things of which I'm probably not even aware. But those are some of the reasons uh, that I got involved in politics and I decided to, to run for office. I'll tell you another personal story. Um, I've always wanted to run for Massachusetts, for Massachusetts Senate. and. I ran, but I ran uh, as somewhat, a, a, you wouldn't know it after the year of my election, but I ran almost as a reluctant candidate. I was always going to do it. It was one of those things I was always going to do. And I'm a lawyer. I was a public defender. I headed the juvenile unit for the Massachusetts Public Defenders uh, Agency, and I loved representing the kids. I loved running that unit. I then ran a state agency in Governor Dukakis' first term, and I was the first woman in history to serve in the Secretary of Public Safety in Massachusetts. 
And uh, I was always going to, it was going to happen tomorrow. There was going to be a better time. Uh, there was going to be a, a time when, of course, it would be perfect, it would be easy, and then I'd run. And, and I found myself in an interesting position. Michael Dukakis lost a primary to Governor Ed King, and I was running a state agency. And I realized then that circumstance had forced me to confront reality, and that, that for me, that was the time. And if I didn't run, I would never run. And I, uh, I, I chose to run, and I spent the better part of a year working full time, and I unseated a 30-year incumbent. And the reason I say that, and I share that story with you, is some people think, well, those people run for office, but it's easy for them. They just have you know, personality. They just put the name on the ballot, and they start, uh, they start putting a campaign together. What I'm saying is it's, it's very difficult for a lot of people. Uh, it's more difficult, I believe, uh, and I'm generalizing, so forgive me, but it's more difficult for a woman. But um, finally, when you get involved and you take the risk, uh, it's a wonderful risk to take. And I was delighted that I had won, but I knew when I was in the campaign that even had I lost, I would not look back and say, gee, you should have done that in life. You should have run. You should have taken the risk. You should have gotten involved. Uh, that at least I had taken the risk, and that was a very important thing for me. It was better, made better by the fact that, that I won. And then four years later, I was the first woman uh, in the history of the Commonwealth to chair the Finance Committee on the part of the Senate. I chaired that committee in four of the best, most exciting uh, growth uh, producing years in the history of the state, and in three or four of the worst, most depressing, most difficult uh, years uh, also in the history of the state. And they were back to back. So it was a wonderful experience for me, and I was delighted to uh, have, been, uh, ha have had the opportunity. What we're going to talk about in my study group is not surprising, uh, the, the, the whole issue of women and women running for political office. We hear this is the year of the, wo the woman, uh, but many of us have heard that over the last decade. You know, every couple of years, this is it, we're all going to break through, and it is the year of the woman. Um, in point of fact, that has not happened. So the question uh, for my study group will be, is this really finally the year of the woman? We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the differences uh, when a woman runs for office and a man, both in terms of credibility, fundraising, campaigning, and the way the media covers us. We're going to focus on the uh, women who are running uh, right now for the United States Senate and what's happening uh, all around the country, what's happening nationally. We're going to talk some history about uh, women who have run for office um, uh, and uh, sort of uh, what's happened uh, in, in terms of the history. And we're going to talk about women who are not in elective office but who sort of are ancillary and, and in some ways are creating a bigger impact than some of the candidates. We're going to talk about wives of the candidates, or spouses really, I should say, and uh, women and men who cover uh, uh, women elected officials, the press, and uh, is there a, a gender bias or a gender difference? Are we covered differently? We're going to talk about women who are appointed uh, both in terms of judgeships and uh, in appointed office. So I think it'll be... Um, I hope it'll be kind of fun. I'd like it to be informal, and I'd like an awful lot of participation uh, from the students. And uh, to close, uh, that is my sort of anecdotal little experience as to how I got here, uh, and I look forward to, to being with you for the semester. <clears throat> Thank you, Pat. Bill Nelson represented the 11th Congressional District in Florida for 13 years. Uh, he served as chair of the Space Subcommittee from 85 to 91. He then went on to practice what he legislated when he flew with the crew of the Columbia, the 24th <coughs> voyage of the space shuttle uh, back uh, in uh, January of 1986. Uh, his more down-to-earth uh, study group uh, is entitled uh, The Party of the Center, the New Democrats. Bill Nelson. Thank you, Charlie. And uh, thank you to my fellow fellows for being such a great group of folks. And thank you all for this fellowship. Um, and with a f familiar ring to a phrase, I now have the best of both worlds. I have a Yale education and a Harvard <laughs> fellowship. <laughs> oh, you'll pay for that in Cambridge. And that, uh, <laughs> that familiar ring came from President Kennedy yeah. two years yeah. into his presidency. Yeah. Uh, when he was invited to Yale, uh, I happened to be there at the time to accept an honorary doctorate. And his first words uh, out there in the old common was, uh, I now have the best of both worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. 
Uh, it's true that President Kennedy was really uh, quite uh, an influence on a bunch of our lives. Uh, I don't know how many of you happened to see that little clip at the Democratic National Convention of Bill Clinton when he was up there at the White House in uh, Boys Nation as a high school senior. And that look on his face that that clip showed of him meeting uh, the president. Uh, it, it was a time in which young people were inspired to get into government. Uh, and that was a time and that was an influence upon me, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, and then I had uh, the privilege and yet uh, awesome task of, of going to President Kennedy's funeral. And my, my Yale roommate's uh, dad took us into the White House uh, that morning as we saw the procession assemble. And uh, just the psychological effects that went through so many of us, uh, young people that were really touched by that, people who wanted to be in government. And, and that's what I'd wanted to do ever since I was a kid. Uh, I grew up in a, in a small, uh, little town in Florida. It's, it's become a, quite a big town now. But uh, back then, it was just an accident of history that I happened to go to what was considered one of the best uh, 10 high schools in the country. Uh, Boston Latin was another one of those. Well, Melbourne High School was at that time. And I, I had the privilege of getting a good education, and I always knew all of my activities. I wanted to be in government. Now, at the same time, we were in the shadow of Cape Canaveral. And uh, the first astronaut corps was selected, the original seven. And they were like household uh, names. And yet, back then, little did I ever have any idea that I would have the privilege of flying in space. But it was through the avenue of government that I had that opportunity. Years later, as a member of Congress, getting elected, having to challenge one of the senior members of the committee in a secret ballot within the Democratic caucus of the committee, I was fortunate to be elected as chairman of the Space Subcommittee. <clears throat> and that was right at the time that NASA was uh, making a decision that it was going to offer to others than the professional astronaut office the opportunity to fly. They were starting to fly some of the scientists from universities. And so they decided that they would give this opportunity to the two chairmen of the respective committees, one a Republican, Jake Garn in the Senate, and me in the House. And then uh, no sooner had we flown than and landed, 10 days later, Challenger blew up. And uh, at that point, I had to go to work to put together and utilize what I had learned in all of that extensive training, and then the insight, and of course, the the instant credibility, the fact that I had been there, that just gave you the credibility of trying to uh, help put the program back together. And uh, Jake Garn was, was tremendously instrumental in that, as was John Glenn, both of them being in the Senate. In NASA, they were paralyzed. It was the biggest story since Watergate. New revelations came out every day of some new horrible mistake that had been made particularly in communication in NASA. And so in, in that atmosphere, uh, we had to go to work. And uh, the future for this country, for this, indeed, for this planet of uh, venturing into space is, is a very exciting one. And sometime later on, even though it's not part of my uh, study group, I plan to uh, bring in as just some additional goodies uh, some of my colleagues, uh, in the astronaut office, as well as some of the Soviet cosmonauts that I've now gotten to know. And it's very interesting to, to have a shared experience. And we now have an organization called the Association of Space Explorers. 
in order to be eligible for membership, you have to have orbited the Earth at least once. <laughs> and to, to learn from these men and women who flew in the Soviet program, both Soviets and foreign nationals, uh, what was going through all of their minds uh, back at the time that we were in this great race to see who could get to the moon first, and then on from there. Uh, to hear about the harrowing experiences that they've had. I, I'll never forget one night, uh, we were in Berlin, and I was able to steer this uh, cocktail conversation uh, between Jim Lovell of the United States, who was the commander of Apollo 13, which was the mission that blew up on the way to the moon. And we thought we had three dead men. And through some incredible uh, ingenuity and fast action on the part of both the crew and the engineers back on the ground, they devised this since they didn't have a, a, an engine. They used the, the motor in the lunar lander to correct a trajectory where then they could use the gravitational pull of the moon to swing them around the moon and back on a trajectory back to Earth. I mean, it was just incredible. And to hear that, and then right next to him, then to have Oleg Komarov. Had the Soviets gone to the moon, and they sent a couple of capsules to the moon, but they never could get their trajectories. We were too much ahead of them in, uh, in, in our advancing computers. They couldn't get their trajectories so that they could get the G-forces on re-entry down to where a human body could stand it, so they never launched. But had they gone, Oleg would have been one of them. And Oleg told us about his fourth flight. Uh, he had gone through the first stage, the, the second stage, and it was time for the third stage to ignite, and nothing happened. And he said, suddenly we were in a ballistic reentry from about 150 kilometers high, pulling up to 22 Gs. He blacked out. When he came to, the parachute had deployed. They didn't know where they were. They were coming down in the mountains. They hit the side of the mountain. The capsule is turning over and over. The chute is dragging. And finally, the chute catches on a tree. And when they climbed out of their spacecraft, they saw that they were that far from a ledge that dropped 3,000 feet straight into a canyon. And his colleague sitting next to him says, he says, at that point, my comrade believed in God. <laughs> <laughs> to see the changes that have come out of that country, it, it makes me uh, flash back to the, the time floating in front of the window. Uh, and, and by the way, that often would occur when the rest of my crew was asleep because every minute is planned when you're on orbit and you're allocated certain time to sleep. And I would cheat on my sleep so that I could float up to the flight deck and just float there in front of the window and, and soak in what is just a marvelous, marvelous home that we know as Earth. And I remember being affected there had been a uh, summit meeting between uh, Reagan and Gorbachev. And I couldn't help but uh, think, wouldn't it be something someday in the future uh, if we have a summit meeting either at the American Space Station, the Soviet Space Station, the International Space Station, whatever it is. And if world leaders, and this is back in the time of the Cold War when we had all of the nukes, honest to, to goodness, pointed at each other. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting if world leaders in making decisions that really lives depended on, war and peace decisions, could have the perspective that those of us in the spacecraft have, to look out and you don't see a country. You can certainly see the geographic boundaries, but after about the third day, you're seeing the entire Earth. And it's all there together. And it is so beautiful. And the atmosphere is this thin little layer that covers the Earth. I became more of an environmentalist when I went into space. Because the environment you can see is so fragile, and the Earth looks so fragile. And yet it is so beautiful 
suspended there in the midst of nothingness. And there's life. And there's home. Well, my dreams uh, certainly uh, have been fulfilled of, of being to be in, able to be in government 12 years in the Congress. Uh, and then to have this dream of, of something that I'd really never dreamed about. But once that little spark was there, to dream about that and to have it uh, become a reality. And now to be able to share this with you and to be able to share as we get into some interesting uh, areas to see, and I'll just conclude with this. Two of the biggest frustrations that I had in Congress. One, the place was way too partisan for its own good. And secondly, it was too ideologically extracted to the polls so that the <laughs> extremes of either side the extreme left and the extreme right were the ones that dominated the attention and that sapped your energy when the rest of us in the middle were trying to form the consensus and the coalition to govern. And of course, uh, as a moderate Democrat, I fought this all along with the liberal wing of the party. The flip side is happening in the Republican Party now. The moderates in the Republican Party having the right wing in the Republican Party dominate there when so much of the coalescing in government comes in the middle in forming those compromises so that you can govern. So in part, we're going to talk about that. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> uh, Barbara Piper brings us the perspective of a Californian who has served as the mayor of her city, La Cañada uh, Flint Ridge, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. She's also uh, served as a, serves as a member of the uh, Los Angeles County Board of Education, uh, and recently she chaired the uh, state's Republican Women's uh, Task Force. Her study group is uh, called California in Crisis, West Coast Trend or National Warning. Barbara Piper. Thank you very much, Charlie. And uh, before I start, a, a real thank you to all of you who have given each of us such a gracious and, and warm welcome and uh, made a home for us no matter how far we've come and uh, pulled us right into the wonderful activities that are happening here. You are uh, in a beautiful world here and you are in a beautiful world in the greater sense that Bill was just addressing and I suspect that the young people with us this evening are perhaps cognizant that it really is a beautiful world and that's why you're interested in government. That's why you're interested in people. That's why you're developing your people skills. And that's why hopefully you'll take those skills and use them to continue that beauty that exists in this world. Uh, I know you've got those skills because first of all, you're, you're involved in a, a worldly pursuit and that is government. Uh, and you will make best advantage of those skills because I have found you all to be so charming. And if you're thinking of running for office, you've got two of the big ones knocked right away. Uh, it's just how you're going to channel that and find your moment. Pat was talking about finding her moment. Um, I thought I'd found my moment uh, last December. We had uh, redistricting in California, and my gosh, there I was in smack dab in the middle of a brand new district no incumbent, and so I decided to go for it. I'm delighted that I did. I had no idea at this time last year that I would have uh, run in a primary for the California State Legislature, raised over a quarter of a million dollars, which is a, a fair amount of money, um, not have been successful, and uh, come out here and have an opportunity to talk about what's going on in California. and. Um, I sense that there is a, a bit of a parochial attitude here on the East Coast towards California. <laughs> Aha! Do I pick up on that just a tad? And as a matter of fact, when I told Charlie at the interview that we might talk about crisis in California, oh yeah, okay, <laughs> they'll go for that one. And um, that's my hook for you folks because we do have a crisis going on in California. Part of it's within the Republican Party. Part of it relates to so many facets of our life out there that we're going to be exploring with some really fascinating people who will be coming to the study group. 
Um, but the other part of it that we're going to learn is that California is the golden state. And we have a lot to offer, and we are growing. And the metamorphoses <coughs> that we <coughs> experience at this point are important lessons for us all. I think that our growth, the, the shedding of our skin, whatever it is that we're going through is going to make us stronger and we're going to see some interesting dynamics come forward as a result of the California experience. Last weekend I had to run back to Los Angeles and give an address at USC to women on uh, women in politics and I'm, I'm glad that Pat is talking about that subject and I'm glad that the Institute of Politics wanted to make a special <coughs> effort to highlight that. And um, I said to these ladies, many of whom are quite, uh, quite the group of the incognoscenti, uh, uh, not knowledgeable about politics at all, but they want to be a part of that beautiful world. And I said to them, you know, there are not many people in terms of politics who want to get between the dog and the fire hydrant. And if they do, and if they're your type of person, get out there and support them. Get out there and work for them. Get out there and do what you need to do to get those people elected. And uh, that's going to be one of the most val valuable lessons for <coughs> the students here in this audience is, gee, I'm kind of interested in politics and I'd really like to get started. I'm making lots of really neat contacts here at Harvard. And, but what do I do? Well, you have to get involved in a race. That's where you're going to learn. You've got to get that practical experience, and I'm more than happy to share war stories and how-tos with anybody. Uh, it's if somebody's going to put themselves forward, and I will, and anybody here who has held political office or run for office knows that it's the, one of the most ex exciting things that you can do, and uh, it puts you personally on the line. Your being, your philosophy. Um, Everything is tested. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're up for it, go for it. How did I get involved in politics? It's a long and complicated story. I had someone in my family who gave me a message that's been very important for women leaders. It's a message that came from my mother that says, you can do this. You have the ability. And I don't say that just to young women. I say it to young men and young women who are interested. If they've got the ability, you can do it. <coughs> and it's important to know that you can and have that faith in yourself. And we had a lot of people <coughs> in our family who were interested in politics. By chance, I had never known this. This summer I discovered that, uh, my, I believe it was my great, great, I've got to research the whole thing. My great, great uncle was the president of Nicaragua sometime in the 1800s. Well, I hadn't known this. They had imported him from California, apparently. They needed somebody to straighten it up. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to research this now when I get back to California and see what the whole story is on the family tree. Uh, so then one says, perhaps there's a genetic anomaly that pushes us in the direction of wanting to be involved in politics. And you wonder, you begin to wonder if you really are twitched. Why do you put yourself in these positions? Well, when uh, being a native <coughs> Californian, I did have a hiatus for a few years and attended school in New York. And when I was in New York, at the age of 16, uh, my mother said, well, it's time to go to Columbia University and have some vocational testing. So my twin sister and I went up to Columbia and we had vocational testing and sat down and the upshot of all of these questions are, do you like to be outdoors? Do you like to be indoors? Do you like to read? Do you like machines? Uh, really inane questions, you think, how are they gonna figure this one out? <coughs> the, uh, the educational uh, vocational psychologist who worked with me said, well, Barbara, you ought to be a politician. <laughs> and I thought, Geez, I, you know, I don't know what they do. This is, I knew this would be screwy, you know, and just filed it away and uh, went to UCLA and majored in history and, and Spanish and became a teacher. And uh, I volunteered on some campaigns. It was kind of fun. And then uh, my city incorporated in 1976, and my husband, who is an attorney and had always been interested in political matters, was the executive director of this effort. And it was interesting, and some people said to me, you ought to run. 
and you know, Pat was saying earlier, well, maybe there's a better time or this or that. And um, I guess I knew at that moment that I really was interested because a little buzzer went off internally and it said, yes, Barbara, you want to run. <laughs> and I had to recognize that and I had to accept that. And then there was another little voice, but it's not your time. And I said, oh, I, I don't know. I, this is very interesting. I'm, I don't think I'm quite ready for this. And right then, I planned for two years out. Um, so you have it within you. There's a voice within you. There's the power within you. There's the ability within you. And I hope that there is the desire within you to be part of a more beautiful world. And as you participate on your life course, I leave with you at least one, one idea that to me has always been important. I think it's important if you're involved in government, if you're involved in public affairs or in the public arena. Um, and this simply is not meant as a religious lesson, but I'll identify it as coming from Ecclesiastes. And it's a simple idea, but it's important if you're going to stay the course and finish the course that whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Barbara these, sometimes these personal perspectives are, are confessions. I think this is the first California Sandinista Republican <laughs> we've ever had at the Institute of Politics. No, you're, you're going your down in history. timeline here. is wrong, Charlie. <laughs> Ken Walker is a, uh, is a veteran uh, newsman. Uh, he's a former White House correspondent for uh, ABC News. He was uh, anchor of the uh, television show um, USA Today, the television show, and uh, an independent columnist and television producer. Ken is going to uh, preside over a study group which will examine the question of, uh, around questions around race and the media. Ken Walker. Thanks, Charlie. <clears throat> this truly is, for me, a very long way from home. I've measured uh, many of the major turning points in my life, including the opportunity to be associated with a group of very special people, very special school, very special students, as how far yeah. I've gone from home. Home for me, for a time in my childhood, was a foster home when my mother found herself suddenly husbandless and trying to raise three kids. After about a year, she was able to reclaim her family with the help of the welfare system. She worked two jobs, put all of us to work to get off welfare and put each of us into parochial schools. I found myself in a parochial school in high school with no financial prospects for college. A high school counselor suggested that I go to the local daily newspaper in Washington, D.C. and ask for a scholarship to college. He said I'd won some writing contests in high school and they probably uh, would look upon this favorably. Well, as I've told some of my fellows here, I was too young to know how ridiculous that was, so I went. The publisher of the paper told me at the time that, Ken, there have been a lot of riots around the country, some here in Washington, and they've caused us here at the Star to reevaluate our commitment to the community. We've decided to increase our investment in the community. He gave me a four-year scholarship and a job, an entry-level job, into the newsroom. Ever since, I've been moving farther and farther away from home. I'd like to think I made the most of those opportunities. I've gone to the point where I've interviewed, talked with, met, and in some cases befriended queens, kings, prime ministers, and presidents, including several from my own country. I've worked in newspapers and magazines and radio and television. And I've seen much of the world and most of this country in ways that few people ever get a chance to. 
But my view has always been from the bottom up. It's been from that foster home, from standing in a food line in a welfare warehouse, and never forgetting that that is what spawned me. That is what sent me forth. And I sympathize with a lot of young African Americans today because I, as a teenager, did not expect to live until I got to 21. For many of uh, the young people today, next week is the long-term future. I can understand that because I lived it. And that really has led me to this place and to conduct the study group I hope to conduct. Having, from this vantage point, seen as much of the world, our country, our political process, I've formed some pretty firm beliefs about the role of the media in general and news organizations in particular, insofar as our democratic institutions are concerned. And I find the media mostly wanting. I hope to explore in the course of these study groups the role the media plays in the perpetuation and the generation of stereotypes so far as racial and ethnic minorities are concerned. I hope to uh, demonstrate hopeful solutions that ethnic and racial minorities are beginning to employ as a way to serve their information needs without the benefit of these kinds of biases. I hope with the support of some of some of you here who may be interested in that topic to, to shed some light on the matter. I, from my world, bring you greetings and I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Ken. Um, finally, uh, Jim Webb uh, is a person of many careers uh, at a very young age. He's a novelist, a screenwriter, former congressional staffer, former secretary of the Navy, very decorated Vietnam veteran, former assistant secretary of defense for veterans affairs. Soon he'll be able to say he's a former fellow of the Institute of Politics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, the, in the meantime, he's going to conduct a study group uh, which goes to his, uh, one of his primary interests now, and that is the the, looking at the people of South Vietnam, uh, what he calls America's forgotten ally, Jim Webb. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we have to be here. Uh, I don't know how many of you have to be here, but uh, appreciate uh, those of you who've come out tonight uh, to meet with us. When we were looking, or when I was listening to people talk about key moments in their lives and um, uh, inputs that caused them to believe certain ways. I was thinking of two of my own. One related to my grandmother uh, who loved Franklin Roosevelt um, because when she was a relatively young widow in East Arkansas with a bunch of young kids uh, and literally starving to the point that uh, on one night, she had to go out and steal feed corn uh, to mix it with lard to feed her family. Uh, Roosevelt put a munitions plant just north of Jacksonville, Arkansas, and uh, she had somewhere to go at about 2.30 in the morning when a bus came through the uh, backlands. She would tell that story to us uh, when she lived with us when I was a child. So that affected uh, that and the fact that my grandfather on my father's side was named Robert E. Lee Webb caused me to uh, affiliate with the Democratic Party at an early age. I would have to describe myself now as uh, a Reagan Democrat looking for a home. And uh, when I look around, this is a rather hard choice. About a year ago, I said there was only two people that I wouldn't vote for, and that was Bush and Clinton, and here we are. Um, <laughs> There's a third and, choice uh, now. And the, uh, the other fellow <laughs> hasn't, uh, you know, I admire certain things he's done for his country, but uh, I'm I think he's in the wrong uh, profession as of 4 o'clock this afternoon. Um, most of my career is an absolute accident, except to say that. Um, the other key moment in my life, which 
started me rolling academically was uh, when my father was about my age, uh, having become the first one in our family to finish high school, he finished college. And it was a very profound moment for me because I was a senior in high school and I went to the, uh, the boys' gym at the University of Omaha and watched all these people filing up to get their diplomas. And here came my father, you know, that had all these people about the age of your students, and then there's this gray-haired guy walking along. And uh, the auditorium is packed, and he gets his diploma, and people are supposed to go and sit down, and he got the thing, and he turned around. I could see he was looking for me, and I was going, oh, no, please, God. <laughs> and he walked right across the gymnasium floor to me in front of all these people and stuck this diploma in my face. You know, he, was, uh, he said, you can get anything you want in this country. Don't you ever forget it. And so he decided that uh, it was very important for me to go to college. I'd been on the, uh, sort of the, the work release program when I was in high school. You know, they, got, they let the people early, let the people out early to go get a job so you don't disrupt study hall, you know. And uh, I'd, I'd been a Golden Gloves boxer and always had a job yeah, but I could always max out on these standardized tests, so uh, I uh, took a test and got into this interview, and you know, you're going for the scholarship, and uh, you know how these people ask you the trick questions, well, I go into this thing, and the guy's asking me these things totally off the wall, and I really wanted this, you know, this was my, my way to do it, and, and the guy says to me, uh, you know, they got all this mud in the Mississippi River. I said, hey, you want the mud out of the Mississippi River? I'll tell you how to get the mud out of the Mississippi River. Here's what you do. You get yourself a conveyor belt, run it across the river, and you put filters on it. And then you shut down the river like five or six hours a day. On either side of the river, build in, and on my mind just going, you know, this, <laughs> build yourself concrete, concrete culverts on either side. And you put, you know, you've been to a car wash. You know, you put these uh, hoses in the, uh, like a car wash in there. You wash the mud out of the filters so it continually goes around. And I said, I tell you, you know, this, I, I was in Omaha, Nebraska. I, I said, you know, the mud in that river is topsoil. You know, so what you do is you wash it out of these filters and you got a truck underneath there and you collect it in the truck and you take it back up the river and you sell it to the farmer, it'll pay for itself. <laughs> and I got the scholarship. The, the, valed, the valedictorian didn't get it, the salutatorian didn't get it. Uh, and I got it. So I, about that time I said, well, I better wrap myself a little tighter and get going with my life. And the, the time that I was able to spend in academia in two different periods interrupted by military service um, really in, encompassed some of the most incredible events that the country has gone through in this half of the century. Uh, I was uh, a freshman at the University of Southern California uh, where I went on the scholarship uh, when John Kennedy was killed. and. Uh, at that time, watching this and just feeling the profound sense of loss that, that the whole country did, uh, I became more firmly convinced that I wanted uh, a life of service, and I defined that as military service. Uh, my, my father had really pushed that into us, that uh, you have a requirement if you want to make things good, to be a leader, to make decisions, to take risks, and to take responsibility. Uh, I went to the Naval Academy from there. The first summer I was in the Naval Academy, I can remember coming back from boxing practice and picking up the Washington Post and seeing the picture from uh, the incident in the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, the four years I was at the Naval Academy, the Vietnam War heated up. Um, Tet 68 occurred the night, or, or in the middle of Tet 68 was the night that we chose our what was called service selection. Uh, there were 22 guys in my battalion uh, who were going to go into the Marine Corps, and 11 of them decided that uh, that wasn't what they wanted to do. Uh, the night before I graduated, Robert Kennedy was shot. I then went off to Vietnam, was shot myself twice, uh, and survived. Um, but when I returned after four years in the Marine Corps, I went to Georgetown Law School. I got to Georgetown Law School about two or three weeks after the Watergate break-in. Uh, I graduated from Georgetown, Georgetown Law School uh, about three or four weeks after Vietnam fell. And those were uh, incredible times to be in academia where these issues were, were really being debated and where uh, people were, where the, the, the abrasions in the country were so strong. Uh, incredibly good in some senses and incredibly frustrating in others. Um, as I said, my, my career really has been an accident. At that time, when I was in law school, I discovered how much I liked to write. 
and I discovered the, uh, the power of the written word uh, and how you could affect issues if you gathered your facts and, and uh, placed them before people in a way that perhaps could give them a different kind of understanding. At the same time, I've always believed that if you're going to write and if you're going to have opinions, you also have to uh, every now and then put your opinions on the line, which is why I've had this uh, alternating career, I guess you would call it, uh, what, what do you call it when you, have a, when you specialize here at Harvard, a concentration. I've had like two concentrations for the last uh, 20 years where I'll go in government for a while and then I'll come out and, and write for a while. And I had, I had thought this would be uh, either one would override the other or that I would eventually become frustrated with one or the other, but actually it's been quite synergistic. Uh, there are not enough people in government who have the opportunity to take a step back and to reflect and to think about why they're doing things. Once you get into a government position, as most of the people at this table know, you're constantly reacting. You have to make decisions and it's very difficult to, to uh, think into the future and, and to really uh, structure uh, in a forward-looking way your philosophy. And very few people who are writing have the opportunity to really test ideas and, uh, and to have to implement them to see how difficult that really is. So I'm, uh, I'm thankful for this accident. Uh, I chose the Vietnamese situation as my topic <coughs> because now that I'm writing, I, I have had the luxury of being able to structure my schedule in a way that I could help uh, with the Vietnamese community here in the United States at a, at a very crucial time. Uh, we, uh, for the first time since 1975, are seriously moving forward. Uh, and we are going to define our relationship with Vietnam uh, in a way that will affect both countries for the next 20 or 25 years. And uh, there's an inscription over the National Archives that says the past is prologue. I think it's very important for all of us to understand all of the aspects of that engagement and its aftermath and its effect on the future. And that is the reason that uh, I designed the study the way that I did. It's a little bit of a misnomer to say this is about the people of South Vietnam. Uh, there were uh, some South Vietnamese who belonged to the Viet Cong. There were North Vietnamese who came uh, and affiliated themselves with the uh, government of the Republic of Vietnam. But essentially, I want to provide a forum for people who have not uh, been heard before, uh, the people who served the uh, Republic of Vietnam, to come and tell their stories and to use that as a, uh, a sounding board, almost a case study, for other people who have had different experiences to come in and, uh, and talk and uh, move all of us into the future. And that's what I'll be doing. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jim. I think you'll agree that we have uh, an outstanding group of fellows, and I hope you take advantage of their time here at the Kennedy School and at the Institute of <clears throat> Politics and, and spend some time with them. Uh, we'll take some questions. First, before uh, we lose the crowd, let me thank the uh, Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics. Uh, you met Ross Guerin, the, the chair of that group. Um, his co-chair, Jonathan Compel, is, is here. Um, stand up, Jonathan, so we can see you. You didn't get to speak tonight. <clears throat> The chair of the study groups uh, committees, Trey Grayson. Trey, do you want to stand up so we can see all six feet? <laughs> Eight of you and, and your group. We thank. Good in some senses and incredibly frustrating in others. Um, as I said, my, my career really has been an accident. At that time, when I was in law school, I discovered how much I liked to write. And I discovered the, uh, the power of the written word. Uh, and how you could affect issues if you gathered your facts and, and uh, placed them before people in a way that perhaps could give them a different kind of understanding. At the same time, I've always believed that if you're going to write and if you're going to have opinions, you also have to uh, every now and then put your opinions on the line, which is why I've had this uh, alternating career, I guess you would call it, uh, what, what do you call it when you, have a, when you specialize here at Harvard? A concentration. I've had like two concentrations for the last uh, 20 years where I'll go in government for a while and then I'll come out and, and write for a while. And I had, I had thought this would be uh, either one would override the other or that 
I would eventually become frustrated with one or the other, but actually it's been quite synergistic. Uh, there are not enough people in government who have the opportunity to take a step back and to reflect and to think about why they're doing things. Once you get into a government position, as most of the people at this table know, you're constantly reacting. You have to make decisions, and it's very difficult to, to uh, think into the future and, and to really uh, structure uh, in a forward-looking way your philosophy. And very few people who are writing have the opportunity to really test ideas and, uh, and to have to implement them to see how difficult that really is. So I'm, uh, I'm thankful for this accident. Uh, I chose the Vietnamese situation as my topic <coughs> because now that I'm writing, I, I have had the luxury of being able to structure my schedule in a way that I could help uh, with the Vietnamese community here in the United States at a, at a very crucial time. Uh, we, uh, for the first time since 1975, are seriously moving forward. Uh, and we are going to define our relationship with Vietnam uh, in a way that will affect both countries for the next 20 or 25 years. And uh, there's an inscription over the National Archives that says the past is prologue. I think it's very important for all of us to understand all of the aspects of that engagement and its aftermath and its effect on the future. And that is the reason that uh, I designed the study the way that I did. It's a little bit of a misnomer to say this is about the people of South Vietnam. Uh, there were uh, some South Vietnamese who belonged to the Viet Cong. There were North Vietnamese who came uh, and affiliated themselves with the uh, government of the Republic of Vietnam. But essentially, I want to provide a forum for people who have not uh, been heard before, uh, the people who served the uh, Republic of Vietnam, to come and tell their stories and to use that as a, uh, a sounding board, almost a case study, for other people who have had different experiences to come in and, uh, and talk and uh, move all of us into the future. And that's what I'll be doing. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Jim. I think you'll agree that we have uh, an outstanding group of fellows, and I hope you take advantage of their time here at the Kennedy School and at the Institute of <clears throat> Politics and, and spend some time with them. Uh, we'll take some questions. First, before uh, we lose the crowd, let me thank the uh, Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics. Uh, you met Ross Guerin, the, the chair of that group. Um, his co-chair, Jonathan Compel, is, is here. Um, stand up, Jonathan, so we can see you. You didn't get to speak tonight. <laughs> the chair of the study groups uh, committees, Trey Grayson. Trey, do you want to stand up so we can see all six feet? <laughs> Eight of you and, and your group. We thank these students do a tremendous amount of work to uh, make these programs at the Institute of Politics happen. They really put these programs on and uh, we're very proud of them. I don't know how they do it and still manage to get um, their education, but they do a great job. And some of them don't get an education. I'm just going to call. <laughs> but they eat. They eat real well. Uh, we'll take a few questions now, and uh, would you please identify yourself in case we don't like your question? We'd like to know who you are. <laughs> and please, on the panel, f direct your question to someone if you like, but please feel free on the panel to kind of jump in and kick it around a little. Elizabeth. Okay. Um, my name is Elizabeth Caputo. Um, I'm chair of the projects committee here. Um, I'm a member of the student advisory committee also. My question is directed, um, I guess, at any of the panelists tonight. Um, we just attended um, a dinner, and one of the um, predominating themes of the discussion was apathy. I'm a little bit curious as to what has distinguished our generation from yours. Um, many of you mentioned uh, President Kennedy in your opening remarks and your um, own personal perspectives. I'm a little bit curious to find out um, from one of you or from all of you a little bit about how you feel um, your generation was more inspired about politics than ours was. And maybe if either of you, any of you could comment on that a little bit. May I make a comment? There's a word that's uh, going around in academic circles called communitarian. And basically, it is turning oneself back to community. In our generation, K 
Kennedy said, ask not what you should do for yourself, but what you can do for your country. And uh, that had an impact. Uh, three people on this panel spoke of how that had an impact upon them. Uh, we came through the 70s and uh, Time Magazine had a cover of a young person and label it the me generation. It was time for I, 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 self-gratification. Perhaps we have come a full cycle. I'm not sure that we've come the full cycle, but perhaps we have. And if we have, then it uh, is certainly a welcome time that we can tar start turning back to community. Uh, to looking to something greater than we, looking to the common good, the common weal, uh, looking to a sense of helping and serving others. Back in uh, those days, there was a leader who symbolized that, a leader who's, who inspired people uh, to want to pursue that avenue. Uh, we'll see if uh, we have that in the future. Now, perhaps it is part of that that has led, perhaps it's been all of these mistakes that we've made that has led to this terribly cynical public that we have. Uh, perhaps it is all of us with feet of clay that constantly makes mistakes in much more polished goldfish bowls so that everyone can see our feet of clay and when we stumble. That has led to this cynicism. But, uh, you know, I've hit a, a couple of ideas there, but hopefully we're coming back to this sense of community. I'd like, if I could, to take a quick crack at that before, unfortunately, I have to catch a train back to Washington for, among other reasons, to get an absentee ballot. Uh, but having uh, been about where you are uh, during the time I think you asked about, uh, I see the nation moves and fits and starts when they have to. And, 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 and I don't think back then in the 60s, for most people, involvement was motivated on community inspiration or doing more for our country than for ourselves. It was self-interested. I think Americans have a unique ability when they realize they're really up the creek with no paddle whatsoever to drop the nonsense and do what needs to be done. We're really up a creek with no paddle whatsoever. And in very basic ways and in large ways, whether you will get a job that everyone led you to believe you'd be able to get coming out of Harvard University whether you'll be able to have a safe home or neighborhood for your family and kids, whether you will be able to send your kids to any kind of school to get any kind of a decent education, whether you'll be able to breathe air that sustains you through life. Critical questions coming to the fore that have become crises that you will have to deal with for your own self-interest, and we can all call it whatever beautiful language we want, but all of us, each of us in our own way, is going to have to reach for a paddle somewhere, and we're all going to be rowing in that boat. Thank you. I gotta go. I got two cents to put in on this question. I think that the 90s are going to make, among the young generation, are going to make the 60s look like a pastoral interlude. I think the protests that grew in the 60s and then diminished in the 70s and 80s, is returning now with a redoubled kind of force. I think, the, I think your generation is going to get angrier and more active and more demanding, and, and the anomie that's characterized the last two decades will disappear, and I think the future of the country lies with your indignation and your moral sense and your energy. Thank you. I'd like to just uh, pop in on this too. Uh, 
1960, I sat in the Los Angeles Coliseum and heard John F. Kennedy give his acceptance speech. And um, as young as I was, um, <laughs> I remember it. And I think uh, his presidency made an impression on each and every one of us. It was also, though, a time <clears throat> of the affluent society term that has come from this community. And the cup was running over. Today, there is less hope, and, and Ken spoke of that. Uh, unfortunately, we, re we are viewing everything as finite. And that decreases one's enthusiasm. I don't think it should. I think it should uh, spur you on. And I agree with Tom. I think it is going to spur some people on because just the other week I sat in this forum and listened to some young people talk about lead or leave. Very interesting, you know, put up or shut up, sign the pledge and reduce the deficit or get out. Okay, maybe some people need to, to hear that and, and, and follow through with that. But there was something else very interesting that was stated that evening by Mr. Cowan. Mr. Cowan said, well, perhaps someday my generation will be as well organized and as strong as AARP. Did I get a shiver up my spine? Yeah. Sir. Yes, my name is Jeff. I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Opportunities like this is what makes being here so special. Uh, my question is for Mr. Matthews. I am a Rochester, New York native. I'm a graduate of Cornell University and our local paper this summer carried an article about um, an organization which you may have a comment on. It's my understanding that Gordon Black, the USA Today pollster, and the Professor Theodore Lowy from Cornell University are among those who are coordinating an effort to create a genuine third party. Um, in fact, the paper quoted them as indicating that later this year uh, they tend to come out with um, what it was termed, I believe, a major announcement as to the uh, sort of direction that they were going to take. I wondered if you had any contact with that effort, if you had any comments on that. I have had some contact, not with the principals, not with Gordon Black or with uh, Weicker, but I've seen some of their uh, initial working documents. And I know that, uh, that they intend, that Gordon Black intends to raise, he says, $15 million to set up political uh, state committees in all 50 states to run a convention uh, and to create an apparatus for a party that's similar to the Democratic and Republican parties. And if indeed uh, those resources are available and if the message they have is parallel to the same kind of uh, iconoclastic, economically independent and honest message that Songus and Rudman are also advocating and that uh, the environmental groups are also advocating and that uh, Ellie Smeal and her women are also advocating if it encompasses that kind of a message to the American people, then he has, then it has a chance of succeeding. The thing that's missing from it though uh, and which I don't know what they intend to do, is this is a party that's being organized from the top down. And I don't think that the country uh, will respond to an elite prescribing uh, to it unless there, is the, unless there is the strongest kind of grassroots component and the strength comes from the bottom up. Uh, so it may get lost in rhetoric if they don't get a critical mass of people, and I'm talking about hundreds of thousands involved in it. The legendary Mr. Goldberg. Hi, I'm Bruce Goldberg. I'm a first year at the law school, and my question specifically is from Mr. Matthews. It draws on your experience with the Peace Corps. I know that one thing Governor Clinton has been talking a lot about is a voluntary national service for students. 
for students interested in revitalizing the cities and doing other work within the United States. I was just wondering what you think the prospects for that are. I think that the concept of national service as a way of providing a communal glue for this country is a very, very exciting idea. My own role in uh, helping to establish the Peace Corps convinced me that that kind of experience was a hell of a lot more valuable to each individual who served in it than it was to the country they went to. And the Peace Corps has had uh, some influence upon our society. And if I were to extrapolate that to our society as a whole, I would certainly think that, uh, that it ought to be a part of our national life. Now the chances of it happening depend on available resources, uh, depends on an economic argument, uh, and it also requires a political courage to uh, promulgate in this country that I don't think exists right now. I've got a little bit different cut on that. I think it's uh, an idea whose time has come. Uh, we tried it out about 10 years ago. It was a little ahead of, t of its time. Uh, I believe that if Clinton is president, that within the first six months, that will be passed through the Congress. Uh, it's certainly a, a part of what he has been speaking about. It's one of his financial components where he eliminates uh, part spending here and replaces it with a spending there, and it ties into the GI, uh, civilian GI Bill, uh, giving you the economic <coughs> benefits for going to college as a result of your community service. So uh, I think we will see that in reality uh, by next summer, uh, signed into law. I think it's interesting to, to look at the, uh, one of the more active groups uh, in the, um, in volunteering to get involved in the emerging, helping the emerging democracies in East and Central Europe and the old Soviet Union. One of the most aggressive active groups was a group of former Peace Corps volunteers, an uh, organization called Plowshares. Those people have not lost the, the impulse or the, uh, uh, the energy to get involved in global activities on an individual volunteer basis. Very interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. I may say something on that too. Um, I've done a good bit of work on looking at the feasibility of those kind of programs. And you typically run into uh, hard uh, fiscal problems with funding it. How are you going to fund it? Where are you going to put these people? What happens if somebody wants to leave? You know, how do you how do you reward them for what they did? How do you penalize them if they if they don't go along, et cetera, et cetera? Um, but there's a good historical model uh, to use, particularly when we look at at the uh, the era that's coming up with shrinking uh, military manpower. If you go back into the 1930s, um, when Douglas MacArthur was chief of staff of the Army, the Army had shrunk to 136,000 people after uh, World War I, and they were starved for a mission. And so when the idea for the CCC came up, the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, MacArthur grabbed it, and he used the uh, Army as the administrative arm uh, to house and run uh, that, or, or provide for the CCC, and that's really how it got off the ground. And uh, you're not going to see those circumstances uh, in the American military in the next six months, but you certainly will in the next two years. We uh, need to be out of here by 9.30, so I think this is going to have to be the last question. We need to be out of here because they turn off the lights. So. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mark Goffman. I'm a first year here at the Kennedy School. Congressman Nelson, in 1988, I was an intern on the television program, Ask Washington. And on my first day there, you were one of the guests. And I, uh, you took time at the end of the show to spend a couple minutes with me, and you autographed your book. And you wrote, um, <laughs> always stay involved. And I've kept that with me, and I guess that's one of the inspirations which has brought me here. My question is about the nature of electoral politics. And I've sort of heard, or it seems that in recent years it's changed in that um, much of your job is now spent fundraising and campaigning, and that some of the real work has shifted. Uh, I'd like for you or anyone else to comment on that. 
the financing mechanism for campaigns has to change. Uh, it is uh, a system that you have accurately characterized it, uh, that the cost of elections is so enormous now that one is compelled uh, if one wants to take advantage of one's incumbency, uh, one is compelled to uh, raise a sizable bank account. And that is a, a factor that will scare off some opposition. Uh, so now that we see more and more races contested, this is, is a constant uh, activity, a daily activity for a member of Congress and increasingly that's in the state legislature as well. Uh, I think it has to change. There's no perfect system. The system that we have now, remember, was a big reform yeah. back in the, uh, somewhere about 1974, Dave Se Obie. I mean, this oh, common cause yeah. caused a lot of that trouble. And, and uh, of course, <laughs> you see, uh, you, you devise any system and someone is going to figure a way that ultimately people will think that that system has outlived its usefulness. So I think that time has come. I'd like to add to that, having <coughs> just been on that cycle of raising a lot of money. Um, and anecdotally, uh, as a candidate and on the rubber chicken circuit, I got food poisoning <laughs> more than once. And um, it's just, a hazard of the occupation and one time I really was sick and uh, my consultant called and somebody was at the house and where's Barbara uh, she's ill <laughs> and described what was wrong tell her to get on the phone <laughs> make her calls today and you know that's what you have to do every day uh, you're in a constant grind uh, to raise absolutely as much money as you can and it's a detractor from the process. And um, perhaps the worst part of it is, is something that you identified in your question is that the decision making occurs at the staff level. God willing, you have a competent staff. Um, that's where the vision comes from too, not the elected leader. That's not what's supposed to happen. Well, thank you all very much for being with us tonight. And as I say, please come by and participate in our study groups and, uh, and call on these people. Uh, they're here to talk with you and to share their experiences with you. And they've had, a, I think, a great time uh, doing that with you tonight. Thanks again for coming.